Welcome, everybody. My name is Tom Wickman. I'm with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. And um, as the room begins to populate and folks uh, get uh, get entered uh, in for the uh, webinar this morning, um, if you'd like uh, in the chat box, you can put down uh, where you're from and uh, you know it uh, who you are and where you're from. And that way we get kind of an idea of uh, who our audience is. And we'll get started in just a minute or so. Got quite a few folks coming in from South Florida. I see Central Florida just uh, just chimed in. Very nice. We're hitting both coasts. Alachua County's in the house. See a lot of Central and South Florida. That's great. I'm not seeing a whole lot of North Florida so far. A little bit of Alachua County, but uh, um, uh, there's there's the Panhandle showing up. Good, nice. Keys, Tallahassee, very nice. Well, I have it as uh, 10.01. Most of the folks have uh, populated the room at this point in time. I think we'll go ahead and get started. So good morning and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series. Um, today's webinar is Bringing in the Butterflies, Designing Butterfly and Pollinator Gardens with Dr. Jarrett Daniels. This webinar is approved for one FNGLA, DBPR, FFLCP, and FDAX CEU. There's a $10 administration fee to receive a certificate for continuing education. I'll put a link in the chat box uh, once the introductions are complete uh, to make payment for the certificate. Um, you'll, uh, you'll receive a certificate of completion for your, your CEU next week, and we'll submit the CEUs to the license, licensing agency early next week. So make sure if you want the CEU to make payment, uh, preferably by the end of the day today. Uh, this is a part of a monthly webinar series held on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Our next webinar is Magical Container Gardens with Debbie Mola from Disney World, scheduled for May 9th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Your microphones have been muted. Please put your questions into the chat box, and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. Also, you'll see a survey uh, invitation pop up. Please take time to fill that out. That survey really helps us uh, kind of gauge the effectiveness of this event and also plan for next year's topics as well. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jarrett Daniels. Dr. Daniels is an associate professor in the entomology and nematology department with UF IFAS. He's also the assistant director of exhibits and public programs at the Florida Museum of Natural History. His current research includes developing sustainable pollination strategies for U.S. specialty crops, evaluating the importance of roadside mowing regimes for native insect pollinators, occurrence distribution and ecological studies for the federally endangered Shouse swallowtail butterfly, plant for wildlife, evaluating different landscape types to determine how they support native wildlife, including insect pollinators, ecology and conservation of the Florida Atala butterfly, remote surveys of the federally endangered Miami blue butterfly, and evaluation of native and non-native plants in agricultural landscapes for conservation of insect pollinators. He's a very busy man, obviously. Dr. Daniels is a very good friend. Um, he's been instrumental in the develop of, development of our FFL Butterfly Gardens app. This is a free app that's available from our website, floridafriendlylandscaping.com. So, if uh, if you haven't already downloaded that app or, or given that app a try, please. Uh, it is a web application. It's accessible anywhere that uh, you do have internet connectivity. 
So today, Dr. Daniels is presenting Bringing in the Butterflies, Designing Butterfly and Pollinator Gardens. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jared Daniels. Thanks so much, Tom, and uh, welcome, everyone. It's always a pleasure to, um, to be here and talk about one of my favorite topics, landscaping for butterflies and other pollinating insects, as well as, of course, birds uh, in this lecture. Um, Oops, sorry. Um, and I, I just want to start out by um, kind of taking the big picture here because we are talking about insects. And it's really um, important that we understand the value and importance that insects provide. So as you all probably are aware, insects are really kind of foundational to terrestrial systems. They are arguably the most diverse a uh, group within the animal kingdom with an estimated five and a half million species. And that number may go up significantly once all species are recorded and named. And I love this last figure. At any one time on planet Earth, there's an estimated 10 quintillion individual insects alive. And that's a lot of zeros. That's like Carl Sagan and astrophysics numbers when you talk about ecological statistics. So Undoubtedly, you know, when you look outside, when you walk outside your door, insects abound, they're around us, they're ubiquitous, and they're just fundamentally important to life on Earth. And of course, we also know that insects provide a number of really key benefits. Unfortunately, most insects often are kind of relegated to uh, disdain by the general public, to uh, being kind of known as elements, as vectors of disease, as plant pests, but the ecological benefits that they provide substantially outweigh any negatives. And so just as an example, they're key to functional diversity on this planet, contributing a wide range of ecosystem services to natural lands, agricultural lands, urban landscapes, including, of course, pollination, natural pest control, nutrient recycling, decomposition, and then if you're a birder or you like other wildlife, of course, insects are kind of fundamental to uh, the basis of the food web. And so everything from migrating birds to small mammals, large mammals, invert, uh, other invertebrates feed on insects in one life stage or another. So overall, they're of really high ecological importance because of the roles that they play in the world around us. And if we just drill down into the service of insect pollination, we know that, again, insects dominate this discussion. While globally, animals are responsible for the pollination of about 87.5% of all flowering plants on Earth, including you know, well over 50 um, different uh, specialty crop species in the U.S., the bulk of this service is delivered by insects. And this increases in significance as you go close to the equator. So about 92.5% of uh, animals along the equator uh, are, are, are animals are responsible for pollinating about 92.5% of plants along the equator. Uh, and it's a little bit you know, less than that further north in uh, on the globe latitudinally. But around Florida, about 87.5% of the flowering plants uh, around us um, on earth are, are really important for, uh, or animals are responsible for their pollination service. And this goes beyond simply food on our table for agriculture. You can make a strong argument that the seeds, nuts, and berries produced by insect pollination really drive food for other wildlife. They maintain natural ecosystems. They're dominant for seed production, for biofuel, for healthy forage, for ruminants. And you can also make a step up argument that uh, without this sort of uh, strong relationship with flowering plants, we wouldn't have other benefits such, such as pharmaceuticals uh, for life on earth for our own med medicinal benefit. So insect pollination is really an essential ecosystem service. And also, if you look at Florida specifically, of course, we, we are just a dominant agricultural state. And of course, bees get the bulk of the attention when it comes to insect pollination. They're arguably the most important and efficient pollinator because they visit blossoms not only for nectar, but also for pollen to partition their nests, uh, to move pollen around. So they, they are actively collecting pollen when they forage. But of course, many other insects are 
pollinators. They might be more coincidental pollinators and pick up grains of pollen when they're visiting a flower for nectar. And these are, of course, things like butterflies, bees, uh, sorry, butterflies, flies, which are incredibly diverse group of pollinators, beetles, which don't get a lot of attention, uh, wasps, which of course are also beneficial um, natural pest control um, predators. And then of course the nocturnal or dominantly nocturnal world of moths are really important um, flower pollinators, including for many crop species. And if you drill down into just Florida agriculture, uh, a good colleague of mine, uh, Rachel Mallinger in the Department of uh, Entomology and Nematology, did a study not too long ago looking at the importance of insect pollination on Florida specialty crops. And she found that um, really insect pollinators are required or beneficial for about 47 uh, different Florida crops, or about 43% of all plants, all crop species grown in Florida. And collectively, this contributes to uh, the annual agricultural income of the state of Florida, you know, relating to about $1.12 billion annually. So uh, as insects go within Florida, so does the agricultural economy. And agriculture is second only to tourism in the state of Florida. And you can also make an argument that insects are vastly important to Florida tourism, maintaining natural lands, the overall productivity of the world around us here in Florida. So insects really are drivers of food in Florida, food security, food on our table, and of course the Florida economy overall. And if you look at native bees, globally there's about 20,000 species of native bees within North America, about 4,000 4, species. And within Florida, we, we have a fairly diverse cadre of species, about 316 of which 29 are fully endemic to the state of Florida. And majority of these are solitary bees. Of course, we have uh, some social or eusocial bees like uh, the, the bumblebee, uh, of course, the non-native western honeybee, but the majority of these are solitary. They nest either in the ground or in cavities or twigs. And because they're solitary, they're not defending a larger hive. So they're very docile creatures. They're easily invited into your landscape. And it takes a lot of energy to get you to get these guys to sting you. So they're safe among families, among children. Um, and they're just wonderful to have in the landscape. And there's so many within Florida that we can attract and enjoy. And some of these are boldly colored. Some of these have really unique behaviors like... Um, uh, leaf cutter bees within Florida that cut out little circles of leaves using for nesting. So there's a, a, a wide range of native bees that we can enjoy and attract within Florida. And all of these are really important to um, the pollination of natural and specialty crops within Florida. And then if you compare this to butterflies, which uh, Florida is the most diverse state east of the Mississippi for butterflies, Globally, there's about 18,000 species of butterflies, about 750 to 800 species within the United States, north of Mexico and Canada. And within Florida, at any given time, about 190 species of butterflies. And that number is not a hard figure because Florida is a long state. It borders more temperate environments to the north and more Caribbean tropical environments to the south. So Florida is sort of the confluence between temperate and tropical. And each year we have sort of a mix of species from more uh, northern latitudes and a number of strays coming in from Cuba and uh, the Caribbean further south. So north to south as you travel, there's a lot of insects, a lot of butterflies, a lot of bees to really enjoy. So it's a fantastic state for watching, attracting, and landscaping for pollinators. And of course, we all know that you know, their importance to the world around us is critical, but the diversity of pollinators and maintaining that diversity is equally critical. There's been a lot of attention about pollinator decline, and we know that because of their role in maintaining the functionality of natural systems and specialty crop systems, that it's not just delivered by one single organism like the Western honeybee. What research has told us time and time again is it's that background of diversity that really 
ensures sustainability and resilience uh, to all the threats that we're throwing at these organisms from habitat loss, overuse of insecticides, climate change, that background of diversity is the safety net, if you will. So if something happens to the Western honeybee or Western honeybee populations continue, continue to decline, that free pollination service delivered by butterflies, bees, um, flies, beetles, it makes up the bulk of that sustainable system. And so I like to equate this sort of to a stock portfolio. If you're an investor, you put all your money in one stock, say the Western honeybee, and that stock tanks, well, you're kind of, you know, out of luck, right? But if you have a diverse portfolio, you know, packed full of native bees and butterflies, bees, beetles, uh, then you can you can kind of weather the tide and the swing north to south over time of all the threats thrown at biodiversity around us and ensuring that natural cropping, natural systems, cropping systems, urban systems are as resilient to continued global change as much as they can be. And of course, the news, as we all know about biodiversity, is not good. Increasing studies show that we're really in... Um, in the throes of a, a, another kind of global, um, you know, massive decline of biodiversity. And this has been shown to be uh, particularly devastating to a lot of insects. And some of these headlines are a little bit uh, flashy, like the insect apocalypse is here. But there's no doubt that insects, including many really critically important insects like pollinators, are declining. And these trends are most notable within well-studied groups like native bees and lepidoptera, butterflies and moths, where we have a lot of data to showcase that indeed these species are kind of trending downward and those trends are increasingly steep. So this is worrisome just because of the key ecosystem services that these organisms provide. And as we continue that trend downward, is there a tipping point where the functionality of systems that we as humans depend on could really be at risk. And so inherent to that is we have to rely on increasing methods to build back that resilience, build back that diversity. And because insects and other biodiversity is declining, even on natural lands like this tall grass prairie up in the Midwest, these natural lands no longer are sufficient to sustaining biodiversity on this planet. So we have to look at other areas. And we're also seeing that even common butterflies or organisms or once common organisms uh, are now declining. If you go back in time 30 years, no biologist would have worried about monarch butterflies, this ubiquitous gateway organism being in danger of severe declines. But over time, over the last 30 years, that's where we are. Within the eastern population of the monarch, it's declined from 1996 to 2014, about 84%. And in the West, those numbers are down even more catastrophically to less than 1% of historic numbers. And it, it's that Western population is actually teetering on the brink of kind of functional extinction. And so we're not at risk of losing the monarch as a species, but we're at risk of losing sort of the functionality of these populations and also the functionality of the annual uh, massive Eastern migration of the monarch. And if it can happen to the monarch, it can happen to many other common species that we hold dear and that provide really essential ecosystem services to um, the world around us. And as a result of that, now more than ever, we have to consider that every type of landscape wild to urban really counts because it's not just one driver of decline. I love this graphic on the left-hand side of the slide by a paper by Dave Wagner. And it's, uh, it's kind of recounting insect decline. And the graphic is called death by a thousand cuts. And it really showcases the global threats and drivers of decline to insects and other biodiversity. And it's not just one driver like habitat loss and fragmentation, but it's everything from fire, nitrification, global climate change, deforestation, introduced species, agricultural intensification, overuse of insecticides, pollution. All these drivers, all these threats are being thrown at biodiversity around us, dwindling the effectiveness 
the numbers of species and overall the resilience of this system. So the only way we can escape this is to look at all different types of landscapes from wild to agro, um, agro intensive landscapes and increasingly into the built environment. And that's really where we have the opportunity to build back populations, build back resources and landscape for wildlife. And from a simple agricultural example here, one way that we can do that is sort of change the practice of what we consider normal. And so this is a an agricultural intensive landscape around Citra. In the background is a squash farm and a squash being planted. And we ultimately have agro-intensive landscapes where we uh, provide a landscape that is ideal for growing specialty crops, but unideal or you know ineffective for attracting pollinating insects. And so one way we can change that model is to sort of enhance the resources that are available for pollinating organisms. And so in this example pictured, in the foreground is one hectare of blooming wildflowers planted to attract a diversity of different pollinating insects and have them spill over onto the target crop in the background. And by doing this, compared to fallow land, we know that these enhanced margins can be quite significant at attracting native bees and other pollinating organisms. And in this model, almost 19 times as many bees were attracted to the enhanced margins versus the control margins. So simple changes of just adding resources can have really impactful benefit. And even though you might not be able to see it, if you were to look at the bare ground around these blooming plants, you would see a multitude of different ground nesting bees. So not only are these plants and these plantings providing floral resources in the form of pollen and nectar for foraging insects, but they're also providing nesting habitat for native bees. And, and, and it's in essence, building up the populations that can spill over on to the target crop, enhance the yield, reduce the potential cost of bringing in, say, another managed bee like bumblebees to the grower, and ultimately kind of changing the paradigm of how these managed landscapes are actually managed through time. And in addition to just providing pollination service, there's really good evidence that these types of enhancements also provide a wealth of other beneficial insects and arthropods, including many predators and parasitoids that can also spill over onto the adjacent landscapes, providing natural pest control, providing, you know, again, opportunities for growers to apply less insecticides to control those nuisance pests on their target crop. And we also know this even from other managed landscapes. And this is a slide uh, by a colleague of mine, Dr. Adam Dale, who works on urban landscapes, including golf courses. And in the model pictured here, he has established um, a wildflower meadows on adjacent land or in uh, non um, sort of fairway areas of golf courses to not only enhance beauty for golfers, but also to provide real benefit for pollinating insects and most importantly, beneficial pest control to turf pests for turf pests. So in this model, he saw a three times increase in native bee abundance with these out of play areas uh, that are planted in wildflowers, but most importantly, significant uh, natural pest control delivered to you know, a wide range of soil dwelling and uh, turf pests, including fall army worms. So, these simple changes of using or adapting landscapes to add diversity can show really functional returns in increasing pollination service, increasing insect diversity and abundance, and providing real-time pest control. And of course, we also know that it can also provide resources for a wide range of other wildlife, including food for wildlife that these insects provide. And this is well known from other uh, landscapes and other applications such as organic farming, where diversifying that landscape can provide not only enhanced pollination service, but also, again, real-time uh, pest control uh, to a, a wide range of different um, organic crops. So kind of that broader farmscape model uh, involving trap plants, 
um, and ultimately diversifying that landscape, kind of the, the model that is going away from that monoculture of agriculture to more diverse plantings and ensuring that we have what looks more like a functional ecosystem uh, to you know, really ensure that we have a, a multitude of different um, interactions happening within one landscape. And those are good models and we can apply those to an increasingly urbanized environment because obviously the majority of humans live in or near cities uh, and that number is increasingly going up. And it doesn't take us uh, much to, to realize this. If you drive along any roadway in Florida, you're, you're seeing kind of uh, loss of natural habitat and built of and building up of uh, urban environments. And, you know, it's kind of pictured here with this example of a suburban development in central Florida. And as a biologist, as a conservation uh, ecologist, you know, this is kind of a, a nightmare scenario, right, for me, because I want to protect the natural world. And if you look at this very artificial landscape, there's not a lot of resources for wildlife picture here. But I, I don't want to take a negative view because there is something we can do with this landscape, because what does each of these homes have? They have yards. And if we can change one homeowner's perspective and they can get their neighbor involved then we can change the entire neighborhood we can make improvements even small improvements to build back that diversity to provide resources for wildlife to provide opportunities for people to reconnect with nature and really make a difference in their own in their own home residential landscape and so it's really taking the view that moving away from this perspective. This is a beautiful home in South Florida. Um, and you know it, it probably retails at around $800,000. But if you're a native bee or a butterfly or a hummingbird and you come into this landscape, there is nothing much here for you. It's dominated by turf. It's dominated by or ornamentals. You don't see anything blooming in this landscape. So how do we change this slightly to something that looks a little more like this, where we have the foundation plantings expanded. We might have turf alternatives. We have increased plant diversity. We have increased blooming plants, native, non-native, Florida friendly, it doesn't really matter. But we've taken that traditional conventional yard and we've transformed it to something that adds a lot of curb appeal, it adds beauty and it really adds wildlife functionality. So now we're creating habitat that can be utilized to attract wildlife, sustain wildlife, engage the property owner, engage the neighbors, and really be um, you know, a, a, a model for where we hope to go in Florida with uh, building back resources for biodiversity. Uh, here's another example, maybe um, a more extreme example of a Florida friendly yard where the homeowner has done a, a fantastic job, really limited the turf area, planted a lot of native and Florida friendly plants, uh, tremendous amount of curb appeal, a lot of different uh, structure, a lot of different texture, a lot of different beauty and really good wildlife functionality here for for this homeowner and so this is the model that we have to aspire to moving forward and as i mentioned before it may seem daunting but if we can move forward with each homeowner taking a little bit of a step forward and with each of these dots if each one of these homeowners takes the advantage and diversifies their landscape, inspires their neighbor to do the same, then we're really cooking with gas. Then we're making a functional difference. And we're also, you know, guess what? We're connecting landscapes. So we're providing movement corridors for wildlife. We're providing new opportunities for wildlife to, you know, come into these landscapes, be functional, build back populations, and add a lot of ecosystem services to these landscapes that can provide a lot of downstream benefits to homeowners, to adjacent lands, um, and, and you know, really inspire people to make a difference. And we know one thing from research and one thing very well, that if you plant it and you add diversity and you add resources, the insect community will follow. And if the insect community follows, then other wildlife will also follow. So simple changes. We don't have to completely rip out everything and change from scratch, but we can simply add 
resources, add some diversity to our landscapes and make really big time uh, impact for insects and other wildlife. And the other thing we know is that uh, we, we know what we don't know. So as we start utilizing the opportunity of urban green space to build back diversity, we're realizing that you know the configuration of these spaces likely matter. The composition of these spaces matter and the design of these spaces matter, but we don't have all the data to say what is the best practice. So a lot of the work that my lab has done in conjunction with other colleagues like, like Dr. Adam Dale at the University of Florida has been to look at these different elements to say, how do we design these spaces to be more functional, to be more attractive and more sustainable to the wildlife that we actually want to attract? And so one of these um, kind of basic studies we did involves the monarch. And this is kind of, again, the gateway bug, that quintessential organism that has motivated people you know, from agencies to individuals to make a difference in the landscape that they manage. And so what we wanted to test in this model was if we're building, say, a monarch way station in a home garden, how does the diversity of the plants in that configuration matter? So in this example, we tested two different variables. We tested a monarch milkweed monoculture that just had one species of milkweed as a host plant for the monarch. And we also tested a mixed species plot that had several species of blooming plants and two species of milkweed to see which was more effective at attracting and sustaining monarchs and also which of these would attract and sustain other beneficial insects and would those have any negative effect on the monarch larvae that were there. And what we found is that maybe surprisingly is that female monarchs when they came in and encountered these landscapes, they actually laid more eggs on the central and milkweed plants within the mixed species plots than the monocultures of, mix, of milkweed. And this sort of flies in the face of what you might consider that planting large amounts of host plant would be more attractive. But no, female monarchs chose those mixed species plots. And we also found that beneficial insects, including vespid wasps, including other, other parasitoids and predatory insects, were much more abundant and diverse in the mixed species plots than they were in the monarch monocultures. But even with their increased abundance, they had no net negative impact on the monarch uh, larvae that were there. So the mixed species pots, spot, pot, uh, plots significantly outperformed the monocultures of milk, milkweed in attracting monarchs, in providing resources for their larvae, and attracting and sustaining beneficial insects. So simple changes in how you configure and design these spaces can have really significant impact to what you attract and sustain over time. And we also wanted to take these types of studies and look at larger residential yards. So this is a model that we came up with or a project we came up with in Gainesville, Florida, looking at comparing conventional yards, Florida friendly yards and native yards for attracting uh, flower visiting insects. And so in this research project, we had 35 yards that were kind of spaced out between conventional Florida friendly and native. We went into each landscape, we mapped out all the blooming plants, we counted every bloom in these in these landscapes, and then we passively collected the flower visiting insects that were attracted to those landscapes. Uh, we also measured variables such as distance to neighboring green space, the size of the landscape, um, to see if that had any impact on attraction. And what we found ultimately was there are three main variables that really drove both pollinator abundance and pollinator diversity. And these were plant diversity. And that's really not a, a, a surprise, right? We know that plant diversity generally increases insect diversity and abundance. The second was bloom abundance. So the more blooms that you had within a landscape, the more attractive that landscape was to mobile flower visiting insects, such as many pollinators. And that should, again, not be a surprise. But was, what was a surprise is that community evenness 
was significantly important. In fact, it trumped all the other uh, drivers of attracting uh, flower visiting insects. And it was synergistic with plant diversity and bloom abundance. And what I mean by community evenness ultimately is that if you go and you plant a landscape or you design a landscape, you can take it from a plant diversity perspective or what might be considered a kid in a candy store approach where you you maximize diversity. You pick one or two of everything and you maximize the number of different species in that landscape. And this is a very uneven community. However, if you cluster species that you know are good and are attracting and are attractive to a wide range of different wildlife and you group those in larger masses, you move from a less even to a more even landscape. And so this provides a recipe for best practice. You can maximize diversity, but pick the best plants that you know are attractive and maximize their um, abundance within the landscape. And so you're designing these spaces more for, say, the human eye and sort of overall design perspective. Larger waves of color are attractive to our eyes visually. And because mobile insect pollinators are also visually hunting organisms, those larger waves of flowers provide sort of billboards in the landscape that can really kind of drive the insect attraction to those landscapes. So again, maximizing diversity, maximizing bloom abundance, but really developing an even community of those best plants drives pollinator attraction to landscapes. And so ultimately what we're trying to do here through studies like this is develop best practices so that homeowners can make informed decisions. If they're going out and they're buying plants or they have limited space within their landscape to actually plant, how can they maximize their impact? How can they get the biggest bang for their buck with simple changes within their landscape, ultimately? And this is a model that has been well known for natural pest control, especially in organic farming, but hasn't really been shown to be particularly impactful for attracting blooming plant, uh, blooming uh, uh, flower visiting uh, insects such as pollinators. So we know from organic agriculture that kind of that community evenness really drives, attracts, and maintains good diversity of beneficials for natural pest control. And so in addition to attracting pollinating insects, that community evenness also maximizes natural enemies within the landscape that can really impact how you maintain these landscapes over time from a pest control perspective. And then, of course, as we kind of look from one landscape to another, the bigger picture here is getting as many neighborhoods, as many landowners involved, as many residential yards involved as possible, so that we, if we are gonna build back that diversity, we're gonna build back those resources, we need to create as many linkages across larger areas of landscapes as possible. And the only way we're gonna do that is to really involve a multitude of different green space from backyard habitats, parks, roadways, utility easements, other urbanized spaces that we can build out and diversify so that we can provide these natural connections, natural opportunities for organisms to move through an increasingly impermeable matrix of urbanization. And again, really try to provide opportunities for people to connect with nature and understand the benefit of what they're doing in that broader landscape, because it does still boil down to encouraging people to make good decisions, but getting them excited about the results that they can create in their own landscape. And if they start seeing those native bees coming into the yard, they see the hummingbirds coming in, they see the multitude of different wildlife coming in, it's going to reinforce that what they're doing is beneficial. It's going to make them natural uh, kind of speakers outward to the community that, hey, I you can make a difference with really little effort and, and really have that impact grow over time. And then uh, I want to segue a little bit here to kind of really talk about kind of some very simple steps that we can all take for um, kind of building back these landscapes or designing and 
maintaining landscapes that are beneficial to pollinating insects and pollinating insects broadly from bees to flies to butterflies and also including hummingbirds within that mix. So insects generally that are attracted to your landscape as pollinators or flora visitors, they, they have very simple requirements. They don't need a lot to be happy. At their core, they need three things really to be happy and functional. They need a lot of floral resources because they need food in pollen or nectar. And if you're a bee, you need food for, you know, really outfitting your nest for your developing young. You need nesting locations. If you're bees, wasps, flies, you might also need host resources. If you're uh, a moth or butterfly, caterpillar or other insects. And because you're an insect, you need limited pesticides or limited chemicals overall to be safe and functional. And with these three things, you can create a landscape that's generally going to be attractive and sustainable to a wide diversity of different uh, insect flower visitors. And one thing that we can do in landscapes is we can provide a mix of flower shapes because we know that insects come in a wide diversity of sizes. They forage in different ways and have different behaviors. And so they can get access to nectar differentially based on their size and their behavior. So as an example, that tropical sage on the far left of this slide, that salvia coccinea, it has a non-weight bearing blossom, a non-attenuating blossom, which some bees can get access to the pollen and nectar, but really larger butterflies that can hover at that blossom or a hummingbird that can hover and feed can most easily get nectar from that blossom. However, a large butterfly that cannot flutter at a blossom like a monarch, it needs a, a stable landing platform. So uh, that purple cone flower, that echinacea to the right of that salvia, that's a perfect landing platform for a large uh, monarch butterfly. It can get access to a lot of uh, nectar at the core of that blossom. And so it provides a lot of resources and a stable landing platform. And then every other type of blossom, you know, really, kind of attracts and is appealing to a wide range of different pollinators. So ultimately, in this model, diversity begets diversity. The more diversity of flower shapes you have in your landscape, the more diversity of flower visiting insects you will ultimately attract. And the same thing goes for uh, flower color. If you pick any uh, book on wildlife landscaping, most authors will say that brightest colors are best and most attractive. And this is generally true. Pinks, purples, oranges are, are really attractive. However, if you sit in a natural landscape and you look at pollinating insects moving from blossom to blossom, even butterflies as a good example, you will quickly realize that different pollinating insects have very different floral color preferences. Some go exclusively to white blossoms. Some might really prefer bright colors like pinks, purples, or reds. So again, diversity begets diversity in this context. So the more diversity of flower color, the more diversity of flower shape that you have, ultimately the greater diversity of flower visiting insects you will attract to your, your wildlife landscaping space. And then of course, if you want to make a garden that isn't just a quickie mart for insects to come in and grab a, a, a drink of nectar and fly out of your landscape. You want to attract them to your yard. You want them to stay in your yard. You want to create actual functional habitat, uh, especially if you're aiming for butterflies or moths, then you need to include larval host plants as well as adult nectar plants uh, in your landscape. And the best way to do this is ultimately to start with the blooming plants first and learn what butterflies and moths come into your space. And then you can plant uh, the host plants for the species that you know are attracted to your yard. Because if you try to reverse engineer this and say, I wanna plant this host plant because I wanna attract this butterfly. Well, you have no idea if that butterfly actually is found in your area or if, it's, if you live in a heavily urbanized area, some species may not really be uh, functionally uh, available within an urban space. So always start with the blooming plants first, buy a good field guide, learn to, or, or go on iNaturalist to 
find out what species are actually found in that area first, and then plan for the organisms that you know are readily common and available within that location. Uh, because it just varies so much north to south in Florida, and whether you're adjacent to a particular natural system, you're in a heavily urbanized core, you live out in the rural portions of um, you know, Lee County or wherever, uh, you just cannot guarantee that if you go the other route and you plant a larval host plant, that that butterfly is actually going to be available and visit your landscape. And then keep in mind that larval host plants or host plants in general are there to be eaten. They're not there just for visual attraction to our eyes. And there's still a lot of folks that don't make this connection as clear as it needs to be. They plant a larval host plant and then they get upset because it's been defoliated by the organism that they actually wanted to attract. So keep in mind that the badge of honor for any wildlife landscaper, butterfly gardener is having their plant material eaten by the organisms that they actually want to attract. So this is a good thing and it will naturally recover, that plant will naturally recover but you have to make it available uh, to be fed upon by the organisms that you actually want to attract. And then really important for Florida, uh, this is critical, especially if you, um, you know, are used to designing for locations outside of Florida, you're moving from a Northern state to Florida, is the fact that in Florida, no matter where you are, North or South, we have to provide resources throughout the continuum of the 12 month growing season within Florida, because no matter at any given time during the year, there are insects around looking to forage and looking for resources to, um, to take advantage of. Even in the dead of winter, there are a multitude of different butterflies and other resources available. So plant for the phenology and making sure that you have blooming resources in the spring, summer, fall, and winter across your landscape. Even if it means only having one plant in bloom during the winter, we still want to make sure that our landscape is attractive through as much of that growing season as possible. And so when you're mapping out and planning your landscape, look at bloom phenology and design to ensure that you have uh, a maximizing kind of longitudinal perspective of blooming plants available in your landscape for pollinators throughout as much of that growing season as functionally possible. And then also, um, I think really important when you design a landscape, you know, look at structure within that space. And you can take a good snapshot from Mother Nature. If you go out to a natural environment, you see a lot of blooming plants low to the ground, mid-level, uh, low canopy, high canopy. And so we really want to design for that horizontal and vertical diversity or structure within the landscape. Not only is this more visually attractive to our eyes, but it provides a wide range of different kind of niches within that landscape for feeding, for finding habitat, for finding nest nesting resources, for escaping predators, for escaping inclement weather. So all these little kind of um, niches within that landscape provide space, occupiable space for the organisms that you want to attract. And so that vertical space, that horizontal space really do matter, even in a very small landscape. So don't just look at one level of blooming resource, uh, aim for a wide range of structure within that landscape as much as you can overall. And then going back to that community evenness uh, research that we did in that model, plant in groupings. This is, is visually much more aesthetically pleasing from a design perspective to our eyes. It maximizes the resources available for plants that you know are really providing you know, high quality resources of pollen, nectar, or, or larval host plant material. Um, these large waves of color in the landscape really add texture, they add visibility, they make it easy for insects and other wildlife to find. Um, and it, it, you know, we really have to move away from the kid in the candy store approach of trying to just put one of every type of plant into our landscape. That, that's a functional way forward, but this is a slightly better way forward. So plant in waves of color, billboards of color, to attract the multitude of insects that you want to attract in your landscape. 
And then, <laughs> excuse me, keep in mind that if you are particularly looking for native bees in your landscape, you need to maintain nesting resources. And this is really easy when it comes to native bees because about 70% of them are ground nesting species, 30% nest in twigs or other uh, dead wood. So bare ground in the landscape is, is easy, it's available. You'll quickly start seeing the little holes in the ground where bees are naturally nesting. Um, if you if they're cavity nesters, leaving dead wood or snags in your environment, not cutting back all the dead wood on your herbaceous flowering plants from the year prior will provide dead twigs that they can nest in as nesting resources. You can also, of course, provide brush piles, which are great as wildlife habitat, leave snags on your property as long as they're safe and not going to fall over and damage your property or fall on somebody. But you know, if anybody that has had a dead tree in their yard know that when you go up to it, it's widely used by woodpeckers, all sorts of other insects, including a wide range of cavity nesting native bees as well. So these are great resources in the landscape. And of course, you can design more aesthetically pleasing sort of bee hotels or bee boxes in your landscape. You can buy these commercially, but I find it's much more engaging as a piece of garden art if you create them naturally within your landscape. So here's one at the Lincoln Park Zoo up in Chicago as a demonstration um, habitat, uh, a multitude of different um, nesting resources here. And it can really be a, a focal point of garden art in your landscape and be functional nesting for a wide range of uh, solitary bees, wasps, spiders, a wide range of beneficial arthropods overall. So you can make this large or as small as you wish, but really, you know, this is where creativity comes into designing a landscape. You can make this a really fun exercise and a focal point to your landscape that provides really functional habitat for native bees as well. And if you have uh, are designing for a garden that is uh, for a family or a school, uh, this is another great learning opportunity as well. And then, of course, you know, I'm a huge proponent of native plants. I, I think native plants don't get the attention they so deserve. Uh, of course, there's a wide range of ornamental, Florida-friendly plants that are, are wonderful for wildlife. But I, I do think we can include more native plants in the landscape overall. And uh, there's generally, uh, you know, a misconception about native plants as being weedy, unattractive, uh, unappealing, poorly utilized overall when it comes to landscape architecture. Um, I think we can do a much better job than we currently do. And the examples shown on this slide are four of what I would argue is some of the most attractive natives for pollinating insects, both visually attractive to our eyes and also functionally attractive to insects. And one of them on the far left is our native azalea, the pinkster azalea, uh, our native wisteria, uh, wisteria fluorescens, uh, butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa, the brilliant, brilliant orange butterfly weed, and then kind of the, 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 the old natural uh, black-eyed Susan, uh, um, um, Rebecca uh, herta, just a fantastic uh, attractive plant when it comes to pollinating insects. And in fact, in many of our agricultural trials, Black-Eyed Susan outperformed almost every other native herbaceous flowering plant. So, you know, they're old staples, but they do a really fantastic job. And the only caveat when you design using natives is that try to ensure that you're using local or regional ecotypes. Because if you buy plants, uh, seed or um, container plants from outside Florida, they generally are maladapted to the climate and systems we have in Florida. They will not perform well. Uh, the homeowners will be, you know, vastly disappointed and ultimately they won't be available for providing the resources to the pollinating insects that we want to attract. So always source locally as much as possible. And also, if you do go to ornamentals or even natives, avoid cultivars and hybrids. And these are pretty widespread um, when you go, to, especially to larger uh, nurseries or suppliers. Um, and there's nothing, you know, detrimental from these from a visual perspective, but they can be quite detrimental to pollinating insects because they're 
they're um, they're grown to be attractive to our eyes, but they sacrifice a lot of the resources that are available to pollinating insects. So they might not have any pollen or nectar available. Then it might have, you know, uh, sort of pollen and nectar that's subpar compared to the the normal uh, true native, or they might have um, other sort of design uh, components of them or, or, or um, uh, functional components like that echinacea, that triple flowered echinacea in the middle of this slide where uh, really the pathway to finding pollen or nectar is sort of um, really hard for a native bee to find because of all that other um, sort of design element of that flower in the core of the heart of that blossom. So it, it makes it difficult for pollinating insects to find the available resources. Many of the available resources from these cultivars are subpar compared to the true native. And some of them actually don't have any resources at all. And then many can also hybridize with uh, the true native in the environment, which can be detrimental to native plant populations as well. So avoid cultivars and hybrids generally, especially triple and double flowered varieties when possible. And then um, even though this flies in the face of some Florida friendly landscaping practices, we have to really think about mulch when it comes to ground nesting bees. So mulch is fine. Mulch is great at retaining water moisture and suppressing weeds in the landscape but avoid really heavy mulch application and try to maintain some area of bare ground within the landscape if you want to have native bees nesting there and always avoid other kind of weed suppressant material like plastic because this is really detrimental to native bee nesting, especially if it's applied um, at, at kind of inappropriate times during the year. You can actually bury bee nests under plastic and then prevent them from actually escaping in the springtime. So minimize heavy application of mulch, be kind of mulch wise within the landscape and avoid other types of weed barriers as much as possible within, uh, within your landscape. And then of course, you know, a, a Florida friendly tenant, right plant, right place, but this is really critical when it comes to wildlife friendly spaces, because if the plant is not in the right location, it will not perform well. The homeowner will be disappointed and ultimately it will not provide a high quality resources for the pollinating insects that you want to attract. So it's not only a visual and plant performance perspective, but it really kind of flies in the face of the attractiveness value of the plant for the organisms that we actually want uh, to uh, attract to our home landscapes. And then where possible, as, as I mentioned earlier, reduce the lawn area because turf is um, overused in most landscapes. It's sort of a, a, the bane of our human existence uh, within the US. And so if we can reduce lawn and turf grass in the landscapes by expanding out those foundational plantings, we can diversify our landscape a little bit more. We might consider turf alternatives such as sunshine mimosa, um, uh, you know, a wide range of different um, other native and non-native turf alternatives. And this will just generally make our landscape spaces more attractive, more diverse, more functional for attracting a wide range of different wildlife, including pollinating insects. And then also important is proper plant selection. So we, we know of course from IPM that healthy plants are less susceptible to pests and will provide you know, more impact in the landscape for their intended benefits. In this context, floral resources or host plant material for the pollinating insects that you want to attract. So source plants from reputable growers ensure that they're healthy when they go into the landscape. And then think about beyond the aesthetics, what value does your plant provide? What, what are you intending that plant to provide in the landscape? Is this simply a floral resource? Is it something else? Is it a structural element? How can we make uh, the proper plant selection so that we choose high quality plant material that when it goes in the landscape, it will have an immediate benefit and not be as susceptible to disease, uh, to um, death by other causes or by um, infestation from uh, pests within the landscape. And then also, 
uh, particularly important for insects is, you know, avoid, you know, broad scale application of chemicals within that landscape because insects are incredibly susceptible to direct contact, to drift. Uh, and this includes even uh, things that we don't always think about, like nesting areas. So even spraying areas adjacent to bare ground can be detrimental to ground nesting bees, as an example. So think about where your chemical is actually going in the landscape and try to reduce it, try to avoid spraying areas where pollinating insects uh, need to occupy. So nesting material, nesting areas, floral resources, avoid application to those areas overall. And think about also when you're sourcing plant material that you think about minimizing the impact of systemic insecticides on those plants. Because we know that compared to the non-systemic sources, which are typically applied, but have a very really, relatively short half-life in the environment, systemics are actually taken up uh, by the plant tissues themselves, and they can really contaminate everything that the pollinator, uh, pollinating insects utilize, the pollen, the nectar, the leaf tissue. Um, so they can be kind of insidious in their impact to the plant. And they also have a very long, a prolonged chronic exposure in the landscape. So when you buy a plant, if it's treated with a systemic, that may not come out of the plant fully for weeks or even months, depending on what chemical was utilized or how much of that chemical was actually uh, utilized at the time of application. So this is particularly worrisome when it comes to um, the use of these plants within wildlife friendly spaces. And we know this from research on this ornamental. This is tropical milkweed, Asclepias curasavica. This is the most commercially available milkweed for the monarch within uh, the southern tier of the U.S. It's become a ubiquitous plant at large big box nurseries and even at smaller specialty nurseries. And there's nothing necessarily evil about this plant. However, when you go to uh, these large scale growers, most of them uh, utilize systemics for soft bodied insect control because these are generally fraught with aphids and whitefly infestations in larger scale nursery production. However, when you're trying to plant them in a landscape as a larval host plant for the monarch, systemic insecticides can be particularly worrisome. And we did trials on these plants using the insecticides that are generally used, utilized by growers. And almost all of those systemics cause between 65 and 85% mortality to monarch larvae. And then also if you buy these from big scale nursery producers or big box stores, those plants that are treated, when you put monarch larvae on them, they had almost 100% mortality of monarch larvae. And those larvae that do not die also tend to grow slowly or grow more slowly. They tend to uh, not yield fully, uh, or yield, they yield less fit organisms downstream. So they have a number of sublethal effects, which ultimately can cause drown, downstream mortality, or if they actually do result in an adult monarch butterfly, generally those are smaller individuals. So they're less fit for reproduction, they're less fit for migration. So systemic insecticides, while incredibly beneficial for pest control, can be quite deleterious to pollinating insects, including, of course, uh, large butterflies like the monarch. And because of this, we have launched at the University of Florida um, a program to actually certify plants as wildlife friendly. And this is um, a, a, a project with several different uh, principal investigators across many different colleges at the University of Florida. And ultimately what we're trying to do with this program is first and foremost, uh, understand what are the barriers from a consumer perspective and what are the, the positives for uh, people buying wildlife friendly plants. So we also work with social scientists to understand, you know, how is the general consumer base feeling about the use of wildlife friendly plants? Do they wanna use more of these? Are they finding it difficult to find plants that are considered to be wildlife friendly? Is it simple and easy for them to understand what are the best practices to do this? And so 
uh, from some of the surveys that we've done so far, it, we, we get a generally very positive response from the general public that you know, almost 70% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that wild, wildlife friendly plants are ecologically valuable. They help increase property values. They're good for water conservation. They make you good neighbors within uh, your environment and they're strongly uh, beneficial to attracting pollinating insects. And generally the barriers to adoption are things not related to economics that no matter what the price of that plant, people are generally gonna buy them. But what they found as being particularly a strong barrier to adoption is the lack of availability of wildlife friendly plants and the lack of information on what actually is the best practice. What are wildlife friendly plants? How do I find them? How do I plant them and include them in my landscape? So this offers an opportunity for direct public education on how to increase adoption of wildlife friendly practices. And then also as part of this effort, we're trying to test a wide range of different chemicals uh, to look at reducing toxicity to the wildlife that we actually want to attract. So we're using that monarch milkweed model system to test these different chemicals, different approaches that can still deliver uh, pest control efficacy, but reduce toxicity to organisms such as the monarch. So downstream, when this wildlife plant certification program is in full swing, these plants will be grown using less toxic alternatives so that when consumers buy plants at nurseries they can uh, and are certified as being wildlife friendly, they're not only good for attracting attracting the wildlife that you want to attract, but they're actually considered wildlife safe for the wildlife that you are trying to attract to your landscape. And then combined with this, we're also developing a graduate and professional certificate program for integrated pest and pollinator management to ensure that when you plant it, that those companies, those landscape and green industry professionals that are often contracted to maintain these landscapes are actually trained with integrated pest and pollinator management in mind so that they can apply less toxic chemicals. They can take a more IPM approach to maintaining these spaces so that it can be aware that not only are they dealing with traditional ornamental plants in the landscape, but they might be dealing with more diverse landscapes, more plants that are traditionally native or Florida friendly that most conventional landscape maintenance firms technically hardly ever see in most conventional landscapes. So we're working to ultimately integrate pest and pollinator management practices within training for green industry professionals so that they can deliver effective pest control uh, deliver good IPM practice, but also keep in mind that they are ultimately manage these, managing these landscapes with the view of attracting and sustaining pollinator populations long-term. And this is critical, especially when it comes to the application of insecticides or other chemicals, including miticides, including uh, herbicide, including fungicide. It's really that entirety of all chemicals used on you know suburban and urban landscapes. So we want to reduce insecticide use. We want to use it effectively. We want to use less toxic chemicals when possible. And we want to treat it locally where we're avoiding treating areas that are widely used by pollinators and where pollinator resources uh, really exist within those landscapes. So ultimately we can design more effective spaces, we can manage them more effectively uh, for the diversity of pollinating insects, and we can create a way that ultimately uh, these residential yards become a net benefit for attracting, sustaining, and also interacting with wildlife. And in context with that, we're reducing water, we're providing these spaces where humans can connect to nature and enjoy their yards as a real resource. And we also increase property values at the same time. So there is a win-win-win across the board in doing these types of different practices. And with that, I'm just gonna say thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, 
about any of the topics that I covered today. So thank you very much. Jared, thank you so much. You covered uh, a lot there and gave us a lot of great information. Um, I do have some questions that uh, some people have asked. And so uh, we'll start first with how can people attract more bumblebees? Uh, so bumblebees are, are generally considered generalist uh, foragers. So they're going to be attracted to a wide range of different uh, blooming resources, but they are a large uh, bee that, that you know, really benefits from sort of um, more uh, robust flowers in the landscape. So those composites like, you know, echinacea or um, rebecca or helianthus sunflowers in the landscape are going to be more attractive generally to bumblebees than some of the smaller bees that can feed on sort of those non-attenuating blossoms. But keep in mind that many bumblebees are also active really early in the year. I mean, you, you see them coming out as queens in January. So that's that, again, having those resources early in the year is really important. Okay, awesome. Um, this person's interested in, you know, planting pollinator friendly plants. Um, they've got large amount of turf area, centipede turf area. Um, they said, you know, how can someone on a limited budget install, you know, so many plants? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And so I, I would say that, you know, again, I tried to emphasize that this isn't about ripping out your landscape. It's about making small changes. So one easy thing is that if you can just expand the foundation bed area that you have of your, around your house, just expand it out another three feet or so and just creep into that turf grass area you have and diversify that space a little bit. That will just be an easy way to start. You don't have to add a lot of plants, but you're just eliminating a little bit of turf. You're increasing some of that plant diversity and you're providing more resources for pollinators and wildlife. It's not that you have to do it all at once. It's taking a piece at a time of what you can, what you can afford and what you can accomplish physically too. Exactly. Okay, great. Um, how can you protect your blooming garden from iguanas and other animals? Wow, that's a, that's a tough <laughs> one. Um, yeah. I don't have a good answer to that because um, iguanas are just um, ravenous generalist herbivores. And so they can really decimate spaces. Um, I, I I don't have a good, I wish I had a good answer to that, but it's just because they're such a ubiquitous and expanding invasive in South Florida, uh, they're, they're really a, a detriment to a lot of different landscapes from natural to residential yards. So the only, the only really way is to sort of, you know, structurally protect those plants and keep the iguanas out. That's the only way I know. Right. And, you know, it's, I, regrettably they they feed on all kinds of things so um are azaleas good winter sources for pollinators um if you're talking about like the ornamental azaleas the, they they do provide some value uh certainly the native azaleas the florida flame the pinkster azalea that are blooming right about now in north florida are you know exceptional for pollinators including hummingbirds um but those ornamental azaleas do provide some value. They're just not as, um, you know, kind of generally um, attractive to a lot of different species. So bumblebees, some butterflies would go to them, but that's about it. Okay, fantastic. Um, do you know the best pipevine species to plant in South Florida? Um, so in South Florida, you're primarily going to have... Um, uh, Badis polydamus, the gold rim swallowtail, and that's one that can feed on a number of non-native uh, pipe vines. So um, it'll feed on a wide range of, of non-natives. Um, um, I'm trying to even think what what some of those are are going to be best to include. I'll, I'll I'll put some in the chat in a little bit. I'm just I'm drawing a blank at the top of my head. Okay, great. Um, when you have a large area of, of housing to attract native bees, do you have to worry about diseases and predators? Um, you don't have to worry about diseases so much. Predators, um, you know, no more so than probably a natural area. If you do, however, um, have a bee box or you develop an artificial nesting structure for native bees, I would clean that out every year or 
completely remake it every year because if you if you have a you know a B hotel and you keep it active for several years, you can attract and maintain kleptoparasites and other diseases and you know that are detrimental to native bee populations. You can also harbor some diseases for native bees. So always start from scratch every year if you have those artificial nesting structures. Okay, fantastic. Are some hybrids treated with pesticides that can harm pollinators? Um, I assume what they're meaning, you know, is I'm not sure whether they're meaning like you talked about with the the tropical milkweed that some of some plants are going to be coming with systemics already uh, being treated that way. I'm not sure if they're talking about even referring to um, you know GMOs or you know that yeah. uh, plants will be already have uh, pesticide issues with them. Yeah, and it's a hard it's a hard call because we don't really know you know when they're available at a retail nursery what has been utilized for pest control, but the the danger with with systemic is like I said, it it's incorporated into the plant tissues and found within the the leaf tissue, within the pollen, within the nectar. So it it is theoretically detrimental to all the resources that these pollinators would utilize. And I like to sort of think, you know, if you can buy more locally from specialty nurseries, it's probably better than big box stores. Um, and if you're buying plants that are meant for butterfly or moth larvae, I would always use the eye test. If the plant looks absolutely pristine, there's no feeding damage, there's no insect on it, it's probably too good to be true. So you can still buy that and sequester it before it goes into your landscape. But you know, theoretically, it's likely treated with systemics and could be detrimental to the organisms you want to attract, at least for a limited period of time. Yeah. Will ground nesting bees, um nest underneath cedar trees? Uh, they'll, they'll nest in a, a wide variety of different, you know, bare ground areas. So what they what they really need is, is you know, some open bare ground uh, that can be scattered amongst other vegetation. But, um, you know, tilling the, the, the land, um, providing heavy mulch, those are going to be things that are going to either directly harm bee nests or they're going to prevent native bees from actually constructing those nests. So any any area of sort of bare ground theoretically could be utilized. Generally, a lot of the native bees do prefer more open sunny locations, but uh, some shaded areas are often used as well. Okay. Um, how can we attract the Itala, Itala butterfly? So the Itala is a, a butterfly found predominantly in Southeast Florida, and it, it, it feeds on a native cycad called the Kunti, uh, Zamia pumila, and this is a common landscape plant. And right now, the Atala is is almost, you know, dominantly found in suburban urban gardens and landscapes versus natural lands. So it's widespread throughout the Miami Dade area, from Homestead all the way up to West Palm and even further north. So if you plant um, Kunti in your yard, you have other blooming plants. Theoretically, at some point, Atalas might find your landscape. Are there any other particular blooming plants that that you're aware of? Not really. I mean, they like they like a lot of white flowered blooms, so you you'll find a lot of the uh, blooming um, palms, particularly attracted to Atala. But they're they're a generalist um, nectar feeder, so as long as they can get access to the nectar, they can utilize it. Great. Um, see a lot of great comments about uh, how much everybody learned and. So um, they, you know, everybody got a lot out of your presentation and really appreciate it. Dr. Daniels, thank you so very much. Um, I would like to remind everyone that uh, we do have uh, another session coming up uh, May 9th at 10 a.m. talking about container gardens. And so uh, please uh, plan on joining us. Don't forget to fill out your evaluation. It helps us uh, improve for next, uh, uh, next year's sessions. Jared, thank you so very much again. Um, it was wonderful and I uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, everybody, very much. Everybody have a great day.